like to invite for the, the next few minutes Dr. Reem Turkmani to, to, to come up and say something about the, the exhibition. Um, Dr. Turkmani is an astrophysicist at Imperial College London. She's also a Royal Society Research Fellow. Uh, but uh, as well as her research in astrophysics, she has a passion and a long-standing uh, interest in the history of science, and in particular the history of Arabic science, and specifically, certainly at the moment, uh, uh, the, the Arabic science in the 17th century, which of course is the century when this society was founded. Um, Reem is also um, a founder and co-chair of the, D the Damask Rose Trust, which is a UK-based charity supporting education and development in her home country of, of Syria. Uh, Reem was going to say a few words about the exhibition Arabic Roots. Reem, over to you. Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, thank you, Charles, for a wonderful lecture, and thank you for the Royal Society for hosting me and for hosting the exhibition. And a special thank to the staff of the Center of History of Science at the Royal Society, which, without whom I couldn't have carried out this research, especially the Dr. Felicity Henderson. She helped me deciphering 17th century handwriting and translating Latin texts, which uh, are not exactly the kind of things you learn as astrophysicists. Uh, I'm going to try to, uh, in, in, in less than 10 minutes, give you, in a nutshell, the story of Arabic roots, which was a four years uh, story. In 2007, uh, Her Highness Sheikha Moza of Qatar was visiting the Royal Society, and uh, the staff of the library made a small show for her out of some of the Arabic books that they found at the library. And I was there, you can see me there in the background, uh, you know, watching, and I was intrigued, indeed. I mean, this is the society which founded the modern science. What was it doing with these old Arabic books? Indeed, it wasn't just collecting books for the heck of it. Uh, this is a you know, society for making, producing new science. What was it doing with these Arabic books 350? years ago. Uh, so I was, I was intrigued by this finding and uh, I've been given access to the um, archives of the Royal Society where I was able to dissolve this, uh, uh, sorry, to solve this uh, uh, puzzle and four, uh, four years later I find myself explaining the answer to Her Highness again and to the President of the Royal Society through this exhibition. So four years I went through uh, part of the archive of the Royal Society, you see part of it which here you have so many shelves called Arabic books, uh, you know you open these uh, the boxes, you find Arabic, Persian, Ottoman, all kinds of books. There are even uh, more books in other, other libraries related to the Royal Society. But most importantly, and this is why this period is so interesting to work on, is that it's so well archived. There's a wonderful archive here at the Royal Society for the history of science. All the letters that can show you how these books were used, how were they acquired, how were they translated, it's all here in the letter of archive of the Royal Society. So, for example, Jim, you asked about Altusi Kabul. I mean, you were wondering whether Copernicus really had access to, I mean, this, this is the, the problem in the Renaissance, there's so much guessing, but during that period, you have concrete evidence. So, for example, one of the books uh, shown in the exhibition, you'll see it in the basement, written by Wallace, 17th century mathematic books, it has all the Sufi uh, uh, solutions to mathematical equations, and he says it, he says this is al-Sufi solutions, and he publishes it in Arabic and in Latin. So, you know, you open the 17th century book of mathematics to find Arabic text in it. So it's the, the evidence is there and it's concrete and it's not, not just, uh, you know, subject to, to, to guessings. I'll run you very quickly through the zones of the exhibition to give you the story in brief. Uh, the first one is the Arabic route. It's the, really the, the diplomatic and trade relationships that were established during the 17th century which enabled this knowledge transfer. Uh, the most important item for me in that uh, uh, zone, if you visit it, is to notice the letter from King Charles I. He sent it to the Levant Company because there was a company that had monopoly on the trade with the East back then. It's an English company with the trade machines all over the, uh, the Muslim world. Uh, he sent them a letter to Aleppo saying, Every ship that leaves the Levant should have on board at least one Arabic or Persian manuscript because there's a huge gap of knowledge in our libraries and these are all in these Arabic books, so please bring it back. Uh, there's so many letters that were sent from the Royal Society to the Arab world, to the embassies, to the trade machines with so many questions, you know, eager for answers, uh, you know, from the people who live there. Um, so many manuscripts were, you know, brought back home during that period through these trade relationships and uh, diplomatic relationships, and we're talking here about tens of thousands of manuscripts. Most of them are now sitting in the Bodleian Library. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this zone here called the Circle of Orientalists shows you 
how these books and manuscripts were actually used. Um, you know, the fact that there were so many people, as you said, live, you know, left to the, lived in the Arab world in Aleppo with the Levant Company missions to learn Arabic and then go back home and help scientists to decipher the, uh, this language and use the content of these books and manuscripts in the making of modern science. Uh, one of my um, most favorite figures out of this zone is this fellow of the Royal Society who was a professor of Arabic himself. There were five professors of Arabic who were fellows of the Royal Society from that period. When he, uh, shortly before he died, he designed his memorial stone. It's sad, but he wrote a letter in Arabic. He wrote a statement in Arabic on this memorial stone, and it's England's oldest Arabic inscription. Um, now, uh, the rest of the exhibition, and this is the content of the Marble Hall. Uh, the Marble Hall tells you the story of the astronomy. Uh, this, this part, uh, the rest of the exhibition tells you how the content of this knowledge, the, the books and manuscripts, were used in the making of modern science. Uh, the story of the astronomy is the most uh, prominent one for many reasons. First, I'm an astronomer, so of course it attracted me the most. Uh, second, because in the 17th century, we saw the world differently. Now, everything is different. The Earth is not the center of the universe anymore. So you have new theories to discover, uh, to, to explain the universe. Uh, and to, to, to prove or disprove a new theory, you have to go back to observations. And this is why Professor Carlson explained, is that th they were very, very interested in the observations. So you have to go and see how did the sun or the moon or, or Venus moved through thousands of years, not just one or two years, to be able to tell me, you know, what, what exactly is the orbit of this uh, object and how, you know, uh, whether your theory is right or not. So it was a huge uh, interest in the uh, observational data of the, uh, of the Arabs and Muslims. And in this hall, uh, my favorite pickups would be the book of Al-Fergani Al because the translator, you know, Jacob Golius, decided to call himself Al-Sheikh Al-Fadil the honored Sheikh. And this is, we're talking about a Danish translator. And what I'm trying to say here is uh, the frontispiece of the book of Al-Battani, and you can see how Al-Battani was also perceived almost, uh, you know, uh, like a king uh, on, the, on the page of the book. Again, you can see how, how Ibn al-Haytham uh, uh, was uh, uh, <clears throat> shown in the frontispiece of another book uh, published during that period, uh, and he was uh, <clears throat> standing here symbolizing reason uh, in the frontispiece of a book written by one of the fellows of the Royal Society. Uh, another interesting story in that section is, uh, again, Hevelius, a 17th century fellow of the Royal Society, produced a new star atlas based on, the, on uh, that of Ulugbeg and al-Sufi. And then when he um, presented this new star atlas, this is the frontispiece of his new book, he said thank you to all of those he relied on, the 10 best astronomers of all time, including al-Battani uh, on the right-hand side and then Ulugbeg himself. Uh, so not only he used their, uh, he used Ulugbek star catalog, as I'm going to show you, but he also said thank you to, uh, to him, and he showed him in a very honorable position, standing shoulder to shoulder next to, you know, Greek and European astronomers. And to me, this sums really the whole history of astronomy uh, in, in one image. Uh, you will see uh, the book that uh, he himself, so I can't show all the stories, you see Ulugbek book, which Charles showed, uh, the Ulubek star catalog, which Hevelius used, uh, and is also displayed here in the, in the cabinet. Uh, this is what you cannot see. This is a page from inside the book. And we opened the book only on the, on the title page, so you cannot see this. And to me, also, this sums the history of astronomy, because in one page, this is the uh, text inside the book, the author found himself having to use six languages to explain the names uh, uh, you know, of stars and um, uh, planets. So he used Latin, Arabic, Persian, you have Syriac, Greek, and Hebrew, all, all in one page. <coughs> Uh, another exhibit in this uh, hall is the interactive exhibit that shows you how this new star atlas that was produced, uh, the Hevelius star atlas, can compare to that, the one he relied on, the Al-Sufi one, by showing you directly all the constellations, the, the, the 10th century Al-Sufi ones and the 17th century Hevelius one. And you can see instantly how similar and different they are. You can see the differences in the art of the period and the... 
uh, just the way we view, it's, it's the same sky, we just dress it up differently, basically, in different periods. And if you follow the text also, you read the nice stories about the names of these stars and the, the Arabic origin of many of uh, the stars of these constellations. Uh, another zone we have upstairs is the chemistry one of Robert Boyle. Uh, as you mentioned, he was mainly interested in Arabic for religious reason, and I found this paper actually in his papers, which has the, in his handwriting, because he learned Arabic himself, uh, the names of uh, theology book and scientific book as well on the same uh, page. Uh, but most importantly, you see this letter here in the window talking about boy, um, which I found in the archive, in one page only. And this is a letter that was sent from Thomas Hyde, who was an Arabist and librarian of the Berlin Library, was sent to Boyle. Thomas Hyde was always finding little secrets here and there in these books and manuscripts at the, at the Bodleian Library and sending it all to Boyle at his request. In one page only, Hyde mentions the names of six Muslim uh, chemists. So he obviously knew what he was looking for. You know, he, he goes on like, you know, talking about Salomoniac, you go and find it in this book, but uh, so-and-so said this about Salomoniac, you find it in Khurasan. According to Ulugbog, Khurasan is on these coordinates and so forth. So he really knew where to look for information. He knew how to find answers for boys uh, at his request. And there's so many of these letters, you know, exchanged between Boyle and Hyde and other uh, Arabists. Now, downstairs, we have uh, many bits and pieces of stories. Uh, my favorite bits is this tree. You'll see an image of this cedar tree. So these are literal Arabic roots. Uh, and this is one of the things that were imported from the region during that period, the 17th century, uh, the trees and plants that enrich the English garden. Uh, if you just, as you enter the Royal Society, you see this huge plane trees. These all belong to, you know, go back to a tree that was imported from Aleppo during that period by Edward Pocock, the famous artist of that period, who also translated science to scientists. And he planted this tree. He planted the plane tree, which still exists. And this, this is a picture of this plane tree up here, still alive until now in Oxford, 370 years plane tree. And the cedar tree as well, which is still alive. Again, England's oldest cedar tree. And another fig tree, which is in the garden of his uh, house in, in Oxford. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, another favorite pickup is you, you asked about the Christian scientists, and this is an example of the uh, uh, products of a very famous uh, uh, Christian physician, uh, Ibn uh, uh, Butlan, who wrote this book, Taqwim al-Sihah, in the 11th century Iraq. And uh, this book was basically, it's, it's a medicine book, but it's, it's, it's written for normal people, and it's all about how to maintain a healthy lifestyle. It, it has all the you know, modern hip about healthy lifestyle, having to exercise regularly, have a healthy diet, a balanced uh, uh, diet, eat fruit and vegetables, uh, keep mental, uh, you know, um, mentally fit and all, all the rest of it. And there's so many beautiful engravings in that book. And uh, you know, these are just uh, some of them. You'll see it in the windows uh, about the, the, uh, the Arabic medicine. Uh, another Favorite story you mentioned, the uh, self-taught philosopher of uh, the story uh, which inspired Robinson Crusoe. Um, again, it's a, it's a story that was translated in the 17th century and influenced philosophy as well in the 17th century. And I invite you to read more about it. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> finally, these people who lived in the region not only learned Arabic and bought manuscript, but they also did a huge favor to the region because they, they described it, they wrote about it, and they documented everything uh, about this region in, in books of, uh, of natural history. Uh, <clears throat> And allow me to be biased here to my country, Syria, and choose two examples of how uh, these uh, uh, you know, people described uh, Syria uh, in particular. So the first book is from the Natural History of Aleppo, written by two fellows of the Royal Society who lived in Aleppo. Uh, it's fascinating books, full of beautiful engravings and you know, stories about social life and uh, natural life in Aleppo. Uh, and uh, the first proper engraving about Palmyra was also made by you know, English people who lived in Syria in the 17th century. Um, and it's also downstairs, and it, it was published in the Royal Society, in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Um, finally, the three Arab fellows, uh, Professor Carlson, you mentioned, um, and uh, <clears throat> 
Indeed, uh, I mean, there were 17th and 18th century, there were three Arabs who were appointed as fellows of the Royal Society, uh, and they were all ambassadors, because there were not so many Arabs roaming around in London, uh, so, uh, except ambassadors. Uh, I was able to find the story behind uh, each one of them, why he was appointed a fellow. Uh, you can see one of them is uh, uh, Ambassador Qasim Agha uh, bin Haddu, who was, you know, fascinated. Uh, People in England were fascinated by him. He became the fashion of the season. When he visited the Royal Society, they showed him all their experimental repertoire. Uh, but the, my favorite out of these uh, ambassadors is uh, uh, Ambassador Qasim Agha, who is a Libyan ambassador uh, to the royal court, uh, who visited the society and gave a lecture about inoculation, about uh, how to immunize against smallpox as practiced in North Africa. And this is why he was appointed as a fellow of the Royal Society. So he stood up to tell the society about how the people in North Africa immunized themselves against smallpox. He gave them safety record, exact numbers about you know, how many people would die if they're in, you know, inoculate 100 and how many would not die. And that was a very reassuring account that was immediately translated and published by fellows of the Royal Society to reassure the public that this n new practice is a very safe and uh, you know, need to be followed. Uh, <clears throat> now I will leave you with this. Uh, and uh, you know, as I said, it was a fascinating learning experience for me. Uh, you know, I'm a scientist and I look at the future and I hope that, you know, with the, we have signs of a new renaissance now being born in the Arab world, and I hope that the, the, the element of knowledge and science to be a very important player in this new relationship between the Arab world and the West uh, to lead to a better relationship and better image of, better image, sorry, of the Arabs and Muslims also uh, in the West. Thank you.